Hello and welcome to the Business of Football, a program put together by the business team of the Liverpool Daily Post. I'm the paper's business editor, my name is Bill Gleeson, and I'm joined by a panel of football finance experts. They are Robert Elston, who is the chief executive of Everton Football Club. Next to him is Professor Tom Cannon, who is head of strategic development at the University of Liverpool and was formerly a professor of sports finance at the University of Buckingham. And we also have the Daily Post's sports editor, John Thompson. Welcome to you all. Thank you very much for taking part in the program. And uh, many of you have been taking part in the program by using the live blog, which is in parallel with this program, been running since 10 o'clock this morning, putting your comments and questions on. And I will be putting some of those comments and questions to the panel in a few minutes' time. But first, to set the scene for us and tell us a bit about the state of finance in the English game, my Daily Post colleague Alex Turner has compiled this report. This is Deloitte's 18th annual review of football finance, and this is PKF's 8th annual survey of club's finance directors. Business consultants and accountancy firms have been studying football in ever greater detail since the creation of the Premier League in 1992, turned football from a sport into an industry. But, as James Dow, who has advised clubs across Europe, explains, football was not created to make money. What's the raison d'etre for being a football club? Uh, is it really to build infrastructure? It's not, is it? It's to supply the best football team. And so naturally the income becomes, and it always has been the way, the income's come in and it's gone out to players. Yeah. Traditionally uh, your, your point of differentiation was how big your stadium was, because that drove your revenues, your bigger attendances. Yeah, that's why the big clubs are big, because they have bigger grounds, bigger gate money, they've got the best players. It's just that we've got different sorts of income streams coming in to football now. And it's always going to be the same. All the income comes in, <coughs> it all goes on to the players. Waste costs in the Premier League saw a 15% rise in two years following a new TV deal in 2001. They steadied before the next TV deal led to a 50% increase in just two years, as wages broke through the £1 billion barrier for the first time, reaching £1.2 billion in the 2007-08 season. Increasing income is clearly critical, but James Dow doesn't believe clubs can gain a competitive advantage through commercial activity. They're not going to get a significant edge. I mean, there's a lot of commercial activities that they engage in, they do engage in successfully, and I know they work very hard at it, all of the clubs do, um, in terms of looking for the sponsorship money and trying to get your own TV deals done and you, you, know, you need a good UEFA Cup run. But fundamentally, yeah, all those little incremental things aren't as significant yeah, as the prize money pot that's available in the Champions League. Nearly 40% of Manchester United's £90 million prize money last season was earned by reaching the Champions League final, while Chelsea and Arsenal shared more than £50 million from their European adventures. Although fourth in the prize money list, Liverpool still earned £20 million of their £70 million prize money from European competition, but Everton missed out. Billy Kearns of Accountants PKF acknowledges that the decision to spend in the hope of breaking into the elite is a tricky one for clubs like Everton. You've got to look at how much are we prepared to, to gamble to get there. And what are the repercussions if we do gamble to get there? And it all goes pear shaped, you know. It's, so it's, it's really down to the, apart from the, the, the footballing side, if you like, where every, every supporter would love their team to be in the Champions League, um, it's down to cold, hard financials, costing out how much it's going to cost to get there um, and how much we're going to make if, if we get in, what, what's the potential benefits in that? And it's looking at that side. Well, that was Billy Kearns finishing Alex Turner's report. Time now to turn to the live blog and to our panel of experts. And um, uh, Robert Elston, Chief Exec of Liverpool Football Club. Um, uh, sorry, I got that wrong. <laughs> Everton Football Club. Um, the uh, bloggers uh, this morning uh, have been asking quite a range of questions. Uh, one of them that surprises me uh, in, in uh, its detail, the... Um, Tax rate has recently been changed in this country. I think it was the last budget, wasn't it? Uh, put up to a top rate of 50% instead of 40%. Um, to what extent is that going to prevent English clubs? Um, and this is a question from a Rob Lowe who's been writing in. To what extent will that be preventing English clubs from competing for the best um, European or uh, other overseas players? I think it's inevitable that it will make it more difficult. Um, our 
recent transfer negotiations involving um, a player playing in Spain and a player playing in Russia um, have been affected by uh, the higher tax rates. Um, they've also been affected by a very poor uh, euro pound exchange rate, yeah. and that doesn't help either. So Do you think perhaps Alonso or um, uh, Ronaldo's decision to move might have been influenced by these financial factors rather than football issues? Who's to say? But I, what I do agree is that uh, the financial challenge of bringing talent into the Premier League is now a tougher one. But I would say uh, what it is doing is eroding in part the substantial advantages that English clubs have over their European rivals. So yes, it's got harder because of tax and exchange rates, but English clubs are far, far better placed to retain and attract talent on the basis of much broader revenue streams, much better facilities, and a much more solid TV landscape. Uh, Tom, Tom that, that has certainly been the case for the past uh, number of years anyway, but will it continue in the future? Will, we, will English clubs still have the advantage? It's going to be a lot tougher, particularly when you're talking about Spain. For the simple reason that not only does Spain have this tax break, which basically means that for the first five years, talent only has to pay a 24% tax rate versus 50% here. But of course, the distribution of revenue in Spain is very different. We have actually a very fair distribution of revenue in the English Premiership, with only a, roughly a two to one difference between what the team at the top and what the team at the bottom gets. In Spain, it's something like 14 to one. So Real Madrid coming top or Barcelona coming top actually get 14 times as much of the TV revenue as the team who come bottom of their equivalent of the Premier League. And that of course feeds into the European League, doesn't it? The, the Champions League, when they play in that, they, they've got this huge financial advantage from, from the way revenue is shared out in Spain. Absolutely, and of course you also have in Real Madrid's case the strength of their relationship with the right in Spain. Don't forget they were created largely by Franco. Um, I'm waiting for UEFA to get very taxed about their ability to do these things and start threatening them in the way that um, they've been threatening the English Premiership, but I don't see it happening in the short term. Um, John Thompson, we've um, had a number of questions on the blog this morning about what people I, suppo I suppose are calling the lack of transparency about transfer fees. Now, you and your uh, sports writers, you, you report transfer fees every August, every January. How transparent are football clubs generally about the money they pay or the money they receive um, uh, for player transfers? They're as transparent as they want to be, Bill. Um, sometimes they are and sometimes they're not. And uh, I often uh, uh, feel for the fans uh, uh, when they read uh, in more than one paper and often on more than one occasion that, that the fee was this, that the fee was that. Um, you know, clubs who are selling players uh, that are valued by their own clubs and their own fans in particular, obviously they'll inflate the agreed price, uh, uh, won't they, and say that they've got more than perhaps they did. And of course, they're enormously complex deals. You do not just, Robert could tell you, I'm sure better well, than yes. I, you do, just do not put a lot of money on the table and the deal is done. There are all kinds of increments and possibilities that, that can raise the fee, as we know. So it's far from an exact science uh, and far from an open hand. Well, well, I'll bring in Robert just on that specific point. I mean, Everton obviously uh, bought Billy, uh, sorry, I don't know, Billy Atov Dinov. Um, I'll say that very quickly. <laughs> um, they bought him recently and. Uh, it's reported that we, uh, Everton paid nine million for it, but, uh, but, but how true is that figure? We, um, we spoke to the Russian club. We were reasonably happy to disclose the transfer fee that we paid for Diniar. Stick to his first name. Um, the Russian club didn't want to do that. The Russian club um, um, had had the player from a very young age. He was captain. He was very much their iconic mm. player, and they wanted to keep the fee undisclosed, and we felt it was right that Everton mm. uh, respected that, which is why... Uh, Bally Letinov's fee uh, remains undisclosed, and I think that's that's fair and reasonable. I uh, guess the thing is, Tom, while clubs might want a certain amount of confidentiality, the fans feel that they are big stakeholders in football clubs, and that they feel almost entitled to that sort of information. Absolutely. It's one of the things that is a peculiarity, particularly of English football, which is this incredible sense of engagement and involvement, and it's one of the things which basically is crucial to clubs to retain their loyalty. It's also a problem, frankly, for people like me who are trying to research in the long term these kind of financial arrangements. But they are very complicated. They're often very um, multiple stages, and there is a tendency to, in a sense, look at the headline figure, which is, might be the nine million pounds. But often these deals involve stage payments. Often there are tax implications that are also 
a whole complication of issues, which makes it very, very difficult for the clubs to reveal in detail what's happening. And therefore, that's, I think, basically something that we, on the outside, often have to live with. Um, Robert, another question we've had in from the live blog comes from a John Spencer and actually quite a few others. Um, uh, John in particular points to your rugby league past mm -hmm. uh, and in rugby league of course they did have and do have a, a cap on wages um, and, and indeed I think Michelle Platini has recently called for something similar. Do you, do, is, a, is a cap on wages, would it be a good thing for football generally and what would it mean for Everton in particular? Um, I think on balance I don't think it would be a good thing for football. My footballing philosophy is very much around um, the free market and clubs take control of their own destinies, earn the money as efficiently, effectively as they can and spend it how they so wish. That would be my overall philosophy. However, there are two fundamental and very significant problems with salary cap. One is enforceability and the other one is policeability. I think that to introduce a salary cap would have to be across the whole game and to actually enforce that. So not just the Premier League, but? Uh, all, all over Europe. We, we over could Europe, not allow yes. um, clubs in other countries to operate outside the salary cap. We compete in an international market for players. We compete in an international market for TV rights. And we compete on an international market for trophies. We cannot allow, I think it would have to be universal. Uh, enforcing that in certain territories will be incredibly difficult policing it and punishing clubs that transgress would be an impossible task. I, I, I just think it has got no legs whatsoever. And John, again, a bit like transfer fees, are salary cla caps some, something you feel the clubs are being honest about? Sorry, it's not caps, are salary levels that they're actually paying Steve Gerrard or whoever else, are they being honestly discussed and disclosed by clubs? Well, I think as much as we're all interested in them, and, and of course we are, particularly some of the figures involved these days, uh, mm -hmm. Clubs would say that's our business, that's our private business, and they don't uh, automatically or, or readily reveal the salaries that they're paying to uh, to their players any more than any other company would reveal John Thompson's or Bill Gleeson's salary, hopefully, to, to their readers. You know, so uh, they don't have to do it, and a lot of it is speculation. Some of it, if, of course, is near the mark. Okay. We saw in Alex's report there, uh, Tom, a lot of data about how the various clubs, Manchester United, Arsenal, Chelsea, etc., are... Um, in a receiving from gate money um, and receiving from merchandising and, and that sort of thing. I mean, a salary cap, if it was a percentage of turnover, it would essentially mean that those same clubs, Manchester United, Arsenal, Chelsea, Liverpool, th they'd remain dominant, wouldn't, wouldn't they? Because they'd have the money to play the top players, the best players, and, and sorry about this, but Everton, Aston Villa, Tottenham and others would, would struggle to match that. Absolutely. I mean, I think Robert summarised the situation very well. You could almost argue a case for it, but I don't think it could be done on a percentage basis because of the reasons you've been given. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's enforceable. I don't think it's policeable. And candidly, I don't trust some of the people who run football clubs that even if they signed it on the line in blood, if at the end of the day a salary deal was necessary to get the player to get them to win a trophy, I'm afraid the, they would happily write out whatever clause they committed themselves to. So. A nice uh, idea. And, and Robert, the other big aspect, the other big feature of all football, but particularly here in England, we see it very sharply, the ownership of clubs, people like uh, uh, Roman Abramovich, big money. We've got Manchester City owned by wealthy, wealthy uh, people from the Middle East. Everton, um, Bill Kenwright has possibly spent every penny he's had on buying the club. Uh, if you look at transfer activity this season, there was no real fresh money going into Everton. The money you spent came from the transfer of Lescott. And th this is a question that John Law and others have, ha have put, basically. Um, the Everton's resources uh, would seem to mean that Everton, for the time being, are pretty inevitably falling behind uh, and will remain behind those big clubs? Well, I think there's two or three things within that bill that I'll pick up on. First one is that we absolutely spent considerably more than the Jolie and Lescott money. Uh, it's interesting how fans are coming to conclusions on that, whilst at the same time mm. admitting that or pointing out that transfer fees are undisclosed. So there's clearly speculation there. But if I can just put that record straight, we spent um, the Jolie and Lescott money and around five million more in transfers. And we've also taken on about three million more over budget in our wage bill. So Jolien's money plus about eight million pounds is this year's investment in players. This is Everton's vision. From Everton. 
you know, we, we as a board recognise that we have to continue to support David Moyes because absolutely everything we're about is progressing up that league table and we squeeze our orange as hard as we possibly can and then we go back and do it again. Uh, there is absolutely no doubt in my mind that we do that and we do that as aggressively as we possibly can. To do more than that, then as I've said in the past, there are two or three things that need to happen. We need a new stadium and uh, one of the messages we saw there was about um, the importance of big stadia and, and how they generate money. At the moment, Goodison constrains our ability to generate sure. money. And we're going we to also come to the stadium in a few minutes. We absolutely need more investment and Bill and the board are the first to admit that we need an owner with deeper pockets than we've currently got. We also need to keep doing what we have been doing for a number of years, which is outperforming our rivals, scouting, identifying, recruiting, buying and selling footballers. And in Deloitte's latest report, we have a wage bill that suggests we should finish 10th, and yet we finish 5th. And that's a combination of an excellent manager and an excellent, essentially, chairman who can negotiate the best possible transfer fees and wage bills. Okay, well, as we heard uh, there from Rose, uh, the issue of a football stadium is, is a big one for football clubs. It's also been on the mind of our bloggers this morning, and they've been writing a considerable amount about it. Uh, my Daily Post colleague, uh, Alistair Horton, has been uh, lo looking into this issue for us and has compiled this report. <coughs> this is Everton's vision for the future. The club wants to move from its much-loved but antiquated Goodison home to a new 50,000-seat stadium in Kirby. It's now waiting for the results of a public inquiry into the scheme, which has been strongly opposed by some fans and residents groups. These fans I interviewed outside Goodison had mixed views. I'm not sure what the alternative is, but I really don't want to go to Kirby. I'd rather stay within uh, in the city limits. I would just think if we do go to Sinop and then spend the money on the players instead, the best way, don't we? What about Kirby as an option? That's the, the one that's on the table. What do you think about that? It's only up the road, only a couple of miles up the road, and I think it's a good idea, personally. Not, yeah, Kirby's as good as anywhere. It's, yeah, yeah. It'd be a shame that we can't build here, but we can't, so if anywhere, Kirby's is good. Do you think it's time for Everton to move to a new stadium? Yeah, but not in Kirby. It's not Liverpool. It's just that one. Everton's the people's club. Yeah, Everton's the people's club. We should be in Liverpool. Liverpool also wants to build a new stadium near its current Anfield home, though that project is on hold thanks to the credit crunch. Both clubs want new grounds to give them the revenues they need to keep up with their rivals. Accountants Deloitte say that in the 2007-2008 season, Manchester United brought in £101 million in matchday revenues, while Chelsea brought in £74 million. Arsenal's move to the Emirates Stadium has helped its annual matchday revenues rise to £94 million. But Liverpool brought in £40 million over the season in matchday revenues, while Everton brought in just £20.5 million, below clubs such as Tottenham Hotspur and Newcastle United. But analyst James Dow says Everton's new stadium may not have a huge impact on its revenues. I actually think that the increase in revenues is probably going to be matched by the increase in costs they take on, effectively what they'll need to pay to service the debt that they take on. Yeah, to build the stadium, so it may not be. It may not. There may not be a correlation. Therefore, that there'll be their surplus income to go on players. Well, that was James Dow finishing Alistair Horton's report. Um, Robert, uh, the issue of a ground move is uh, something that uh, is, is top of the agenda on the blog this morning. I would say, and so we'll give it a little time now. Uh, first question uh, from a um, from a Tony Kelly. Uh, he he says he comes from a very large family of Evertonians. Forty of them, he says. Thirty eight of them, I think he says, w won't be following Everton to Kirby. Do you worry that other fans may do the same? Uh, it's an issue we're very aware of, and it's an issue we take very seriously. Um, but we believe. Um, we believe we can fill the new stadium at Kirby. Um, we know that that will take a lot of hard work, but we also know that the number of Evertonians currently buying tickets, the location, geography of where those fans are, the fact that Kirby will be um, a considerably better stadium than Goodison, the fact that clubs historically when they move stadium have seen significant uplifts in attendances, all those sorts of things and more alongside a very concerted um, and well thought through marketing plan, uh, through proper effective pricing, etc., etc., give, gives us the confidence that uh, we will fill the stadium. 
I, I suspect Tony Kelly's comments were motivated by uh, not, not really being happy with the move at all. We've had another comment from a Jerry Murphy, John, um, which basically is not so much as I don't want to go as, as I won't be able to go. He lives on the Wirral, and it's his argument that the transport links, particularly now it seems like there won't be a tram link, uh, make the journey to Kirby that bit much more difficult, that bit longer, and will deter people. Do, do, do you think that could be a problem? If he says it could for him, then perhaps it could be for him. But I know, uh, you know, the club uh, and, and the experts around them are looking at this very closely. Listen, all of these concerns from Evertonians are because they care deeply about their football club. Mm. There's no doubt about that. And you have to respect the views of the mm. fans who say they can't go or they won't go. Uh, and there's plenty of evidence to suggest that Everton are taking all of this on board. It's, n it's always controversial when football clubs move or propose to move. It is, after all, though, in a part of Merseyside which is to many people as much a part of Liverpool as anywhere else. Well, I think that, 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 that's a fair point, but it's still that little bit further from the world. When the ground move was originally proposed, there was the hope there would be the tram link out to Kirby, but that's not happening. Is that going to be a big problem? We're working very hard, or we will start work um, very hard when we get the green light on the stadium on a transport plan. Mm -hmm. I fully um, endorse what John says and back up what John says. The motivations are because the fans care deeply, but um, if we're running our business correctly and running the club correctly, then we are um, taking those views on board mm -hmm. and we're looking at ways to deal with it. We can't afford to have fans turning their back on Everton and we will do everything we can to make sure that doesn't happen. Uh, and Tom, um, am I right in thinking you're from Kirby originally? Well, I was actually born and we lived off Stanley Road and then when I was 11 we were rehoused out to Kirby. Right, so. Okay. so what is your view on um, the benefits that, uh, of a ground move uh, by Everton to Kirby? What are the benefits for the town? Well for, Ker for Kirby and for Knowsley the obvious benefits is you have a major national international asset in the, in the town therefore there's a big advantage there. The second big advantage of course is in terms of physical development there are jobs created and the other good thing about Everton is they have a fantastic community program. The Everton Foundation mm. has a global reputation in terms of its work in the community. And only yesterday I was talking to a Liverpool supporter, actually, who's working with Everton, the Everton Foundation, on a program to help the unemployed. And he said he's, you know, he said he actually gave a speech recently where he, where he said he was ashamed to be a Liverpool supporter when he saw how much Everton were doing. So Everton are great at their work in the community and the truth is they will add an awful lot of value to Kirby and Knowsley. So you think jobs will be created, uh, greater economic output in Kirby as a result of Everton and Tesco developing uh, their plans? Absolutely. I mean the truth is we will see everything from the city borough's um, profile right through to jobs. I think all the evidences that we've seen, and it's not just in terms of when you get a ground move, but it's when we've seen, for example, the enormous profile that places like Hull and Burnley have had because they've got a Premier League club and suddenly Hull is <laughs> pitching to be a host for the World Cup in <laughs> 2018, one of the host cities. And why? Because they've got a Premiership team. Mm -hmm. The benefits to any community. But don't forget, oh, when I moved, Kirby was part of Liverpool. And I think there are people who say, well, actually, this is just an anomaly of a Conservative government drawing boundaries. And I think a lot of the people there were saying exactly the same time, it wouldn't surprise me if the boundary wasn't redrawn. And actually, Everton ended up back in Liverpool. Well, there you go. There's a possibility. One of the, uh, Robert, one of the top uh, issues that a lot of fans have been writing about on the blog this morning is the financing of the whole ground move. Now, we know that Everton are chipping in Tesco are chipping in and Nosley are contributing the ground. Just tell us how the cost of that stadium split between those various par partners. I mean, as was widely reported at the time of the inquiry, the um, total project cost is around £130 million. Um, I have to say, 12 months ago, when we looked at the specification of the stadium, that was looking challenging. However, it's very clear to me now that construction costs, labour costs, development costs, are falling and I think that is now much less of an issue for us. Out of the 130, Tesco's are funding 52 million and Everton will need to find 78. Mm. Um, if, as one of the commentators said on the, on the piece there, we are finding 78 million all by debt, which would be, I suspect, nine impossible, probably is impossible, then well, I guess the, financial, the, the financial equation Where of the new stadium would, um, would not work, would not stack up. The reality is 
that we will be finding the 78 million through a blend of funding, which again was reported at the inquiry, which is the sale of Goodison Park, which is the sale, hopefully, once we get planning on Belfield of that piece of land. Because that's and been turned down so far. Ab it? Absolutely, yeah. but we're confident. about 10 million of it? Um, it's a, propor a proportion of it. It was worth a lot more when we thought we would get planning and we were um, okay. let down, I guess, by the City Council. But there is also a substantial element which will come through sponsorship, through naming rights, and through deals with brewers and betting companies and technology partners. So there is a whole raft, a blend of what? financing opportunities that absolutely are probably harder than they were 12 months ago. Well, that's exactly right. Here we are in the middle of the credit crunch. Tom, could the credit crunch um, in any sense scupper Everton's ambitions to raise £78 million? Pounds? You used a very big word, scupper. I don't think so. I think the truth of the matter is that at the moment, sport, and football in particular, is still seen as a high-profile global development. I think the naming rights issue will be resolved. I think one of the most important elements in it is actually this, the fact that as a community, this community of Liverpool and Merseyside are pitching to be one of the hosts for the 2018 World Cup. That decision will have to be made in December and with any luck, Everton will probably look like they will be the only one of the two great clubs on Merseyside that actually has a compliance. So actually it may well be that the only mm. compliant stadium on Merseyside that can actually be put forward as part of England's bid in 2018 would be the new Everton Stadium. Now, that will make fundraising far easier. I think it will still be hard, but I certainly don't see the credit crunch scuppering the development. Yeah, Robert, I'll bring you back to naming rights. Uh, Everton have been trying to raise money through naming rights for what, more, one, two years now? Well, uh, sorry, sorry but that's not actually, uh, not actually true. Um, we tested the market about 18 months ago, but at the point the project was called in and at the point we got into public inquiry, mm. it made no sense to us to carry on that search. Okay. We, got, we were meeting a, a global brand in Japan to talk about naming rights, and at that point um, we didn't have a stadium to name with certainty. So, Do you feel um, we could go back to that global brand once? Of course, once of course. And we, listen, the sponsorship market is tougher than it has been. Um, it's not going to be easy, um, but we're confident. And we're confident because primarily, in my view, the success of the Emirates and the naming right potential of that, the, mm. the, 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 that case study has shown how valuable to an international brand naming rights are. That, yes. to me, gives me a lot of confidence. But, but John, um, Liverpool made no secret of the fact that they were looking for something like 100 million for naming rights deals for their stadia, and that came to nothing. Um, uh, I, I guess the scepticism of Everton fans writing on the blog this morning stems from the fact that, that in a sense, they, may, they feel they've heard it all before with the King's Dock venture that did, didn't come to anything. Do, do Everton really have to sort of, you know, is seeing believing when it comes to Everton and, and raising the money for this stadium? It probably is for Everton and it probably is for Liverpool. I find it um, a little perplexing that one of the greatest cities in the world, certainly in Europe and most certainly in England, for football. It is part of the fabric. It almost defines Liverpool as a city in a region. Some people don't like that, but that's the truth. That Everton and Liverpool haven't yet been able to establish the modern new state that everybody at those mm. clubs and who has any interest and care for those clubs acknowledges that they deserve and they need. But there is an awful lot of hard work going on now in difficult circumstances to get the two clubs there. They've both got enormous fan bases. I think they're both of operating separately in separate stadia. But it is, a, as I say, a little perplexing uh, that it hasn't happened yet, a little worrying, but the work goes on, and I think there's a firm belief that it will happen eventually, mm -hmm. and yes, then people will be able to see and believe. But, well, exactly, but Robert, I mean, a lot of confidence being expressed there, and you've expressed it yourself, but do you understand the scepticism given what happened previously with the King's Dock? I agree. Um, seeing is believing. I think that's true in everything you do. We, we are a club that you know, believes actions speak louder than words, and, and, and we have to live by that. It's up to us to deliver. Um, and, you know, we're intent on delivering. I, 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 you know, let's be clear, there's a lot of confidence, but there's also a lot of recognition that it ain't going to be easy. Tom, uh, in James Dow's report, in James Dow's comments in, in Alistair's report, uh, he, he made a, a point there that uh, a lot of the extra revenue that Everton might gain from, from a state, in, when, you know, on match days, the actual sort of headline revenue figure might then creep up a bit more towards the level of Arsenal and Chelsea and others. 
But a lot of it will get eaten up in paying off the capital expenditure costs of building the stadium in the first place. And there are suggestions from a number of our bloggers that it just might be more economic to redevelop Goodison. Any, any thoughts on that? Any sign of logic in that argument? Well, I'd make two points. First of all, I was at the AGM when Robert actually went through all the scenarios which he put to all the shareholders. And he put every scenario. And give credit sometimes to the club. Please, Evertonians. And the club actually have done everything from looking at redeveloping the Bullens Road stand right through to changing the direction of the stadium and every factor. And nothing works out better in terms of a return than a new stadium in a bigger uh, location. Now, Kirby's the only place currently on the table that's offering that bigger location, that footprint. I think James was a bit naive in some of his comments. The truth is, no football club makes money out of profits. They all make money out of what's called capital growth. That's where money is made in football, out of capital growth. It's well, why the owners make the money. The mo owners money. make the money. But yeah. they're the investors, they're the proprietors, they're the primary stakeholders, they're the decision makers. So when David Moore sold Liverpool to Hicks and Gillette, he made what seems to be a massive profit on his original investment. You can look at Newcastle United, you can look at Manchester United, you can look at Ken Bates. That's where money is made. It's not made. But the other thing is, the best predictor of, re of performance and success is revenue. It's revenue. And it has been, there's been innumerable studies, not just by me, but by other economists, other analysts, and it is always the best predictor. And the graphs okay. have been produced for 20 years. You need the revenue to produce the resources, to produce the trophies. What do you make of uh, James Dow's comments that uh, any increased revenue will be eaten up in capital expenditure, paying think, off the capital expenditure? I mean, I think, I think Bill, I, I, I answered that last time round, where uh, James is potentially assuming that it's debt, isn't uh, it? Uh, James yeah. is assuming a very, very low level of naming rights, if any. I don't know if he's factored in the sale proceeds of our two properties. I don't know if he's factored in the ability to do deals with technology companies. Um, if it is all debt, then, as I said, that will, I think, um, make the financial model look now and impossible. But it won't be the case. And one very last brief question. Everton, in moving to Kirby, give up their status as landlord. Is that correct? They become a tenant? We become a tenant on a 999 year lease at uh, a peppercorn rent, which okay. to me is pretty close. Well, it's just to I asked because Dave Kelly has written in and he quotes back to uh, what, what happened in 1892. Tom, you're the historian. <laughs> what happened in 1892? Everton moved away from a shared arrangement with Liverpool, who upped the, upped the rent. Well, also, they got a new tenant, and it may well be that the solution to Liverpool's problems is to buy our ground and move into a superior facility anyway. Well, there you have it. Um, uh, thank you very much for taking part in the live blog. Thank you very much to the panel for taking part uh, and joining us this morning. But I'm afraid that brings us to the end of the business of sport, the business of football. Um, from me, Bill Gleeson, and the rest of the team here at the Liverpool Daily Post, goodbye.